Well, good morning, Riverside, and thank you for joining us this morning uh, on this wonderful Sunday morning. And I'm excited to come to you and to, to bring the word this morning and to preach. And we're going to be in Mark 13 today. And I don't know about you, but I've been enjoying walking through the whole book of Mark together. And I know that we are covering large pieces in the scripture with each chapter. But uh, hopefully by now you're getting a sense of just the overall theme of Mark and what he's trying to share uh, about the life of Jesus. And, and as I go through the scripture, there are two things that have sort of stuck out to me with the scripture. The first one is the urgency which Jesus goes and he's sharing. is really talking about his death and resurrection. And we see an urgency with that as Jesus is moving with a sense of urgency. And also, it's amazing that when we watch Jesus and how often he talks about future events coming true, what does that mean? Well, we have the benefit of hindsight now. One of the things that we can look at is Jesus talks about his death and resurrection and what? It happens. And so one of the things that I want to look at today in this scripture is how Jesus, again, talks about future events. And in one case, it comes true. But the other one, we're going to see of what will happen in the future, that we can look at Jesus and the things that he says as being reliable. And so oftentimes you'll hear, every once in a while you'll hear people talk about uh, sermons in scripture that talk about the end times. Well, today's sermon and this particular scripture deals with end times. And so I call this sermon knowing when the end is near, because that's what Jesus is going to do, is he's going to talk about that and share what it looks like when the end is near. And so let's just, before we get started, let's just pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time today and the chance to come together. We pray, God, that you would help us to slow down and to read the scripture to understand and to apply it to our lives, Father. And we thank you that you have brought us to a place where we are here this morning to listen to your word. Please make this scripture come alive in our hearts and in our lives, Father. And we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are in Mark 13. I want to start off just by going through the first couple verses. And it says this in Mark 13, uh, verses 1 and 2. And as he came out of the temple... One of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And so if we stop right there for a second, remember where we were. Chapter 12 ends as Jesus is praising a woman who has now put two mites in the treasury of the temple. And so Jesus praises her because she gives out of a lack of what she has instead of the abundance of what she has. And so Jesus goes and praises her. So he's in the, he's in the temple. And so now he's walking out of the temple. And as he's walking out, one of his disciples says to him, Teacher, look what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And what Jesus does is he predicts the destruction of the temple. Talk about a downer, right? And so here you are noticing the temple and the beautiful artwork and the beauty of the building itself and Jesus goes from there and says oh yeah by the way this is not going to be here this will be destroyed and so if you think about the temple itself remember the temple had already been destroyed one time in the Old Testament so the Babylonians come in they destroy the temple it's then rebuilt by a remnant that comes back to Jerusalem the temple is rebuilt again but it's not really the same size as it was before. And so they rebuild it, but it doesn't have the glory that it had before. There was something sort of disappointing about it to some of the people. And so not only that, so Herod comes, King Herod comes, and he actually doubles the size, according to historians, he doubles the size of the temple. So now it has become this big structure with just beauty and artwork, and it's just the splendor of the temple itself. And it's funny how often we can be in awe of the size and the beauty of religious things. And I remember in particular going to Europe 
And I think about Spain in particular and seeing some of these cathedrals that they had built, just the beauty and the size of the cathedrals. But it's a shame because when you actually go inside these places, you find out that there's very little happening inside with the exception of tourists coming through and looking at it. And so this particular title, uh, temple had become an idol. And because it had been just about a building in its size, in its grandeur, in its splendor, and they had sort of lost the sense of why the building was there in the first place. And I think sometimes we fall into the same trap where we see a big, beautiful church building and think, wow, that's where God is. And we tend to look at the little rundown church that's operating, that, that that maybe is less, they're less faithful to God than the church, that it's actually a big church. And so here's this temple. It's huge, and they had sort of lost sight of the very reason why it was there in the beginning. And so we ask the question, well, then why will it be destroyed? Jesus talks about this in the last chapter when he talks about the parable of the tenants. And he's saying the tenants, you know, it's leased. Uh, an owner has a vineyard that's leased to tenants. And so when he sends a servant there, they beat him up, and they do that again and again and again until they finally get to the son and they kill the son. And so there's a misuse of the temple and the purpose of the temple, right? And so the temple wasn't always going to be the final piece. It wasn't always how it was going to be. The sacrificial system wasn't always going to be the end piece. Jesus was the temple himself. And if you remember Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well, when she says here, I know for you and the Jews, you worship in Jerusalem, we worship here as Samaritans. And Jesus says one day it's not going to matter where you worship. God wants those who worship in spirit and truth. Jesus even says himself, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. He's talking about himself. The ultimate purpose of the temple and Jesus is for the relationship with the Father. And that had been lost. And so even the disciples comment was what a beautiful building i think in some ways you can think about that and it loses sight of the real purpose of the temple itself was not just to have this big huge temple that's beautiful but a place where you could go and you can worship god and that had been lost and the misuse of the temple it's one of the reasons why jesus goes and flips over the tables. he says this is to be a house of prayer it's about connecting with the Father and not just doing business as usual. And for that reason, the temple is going to be destroyed by the Romans in A.D. 66 to 70. And so now Jesus earlier predicts his death and resurrection. He tells them, in hindsight, we can look at that and we see that happens. Now he talks about the destruction of the temple. That actually happened. And so as Jesus is in the business of predicting and telling what is going to happen, he begins to transition to an even larger picture of what's going to happen. I think just one insight and one thing to think about this particular scripture too is it's amazing how God has no problem allowing something to be taken away that might be used in wrongful purposes. He has no fear of removing things that hinder people from knowing him. And you see that by allowing the temple to be destroyed. And so this is showing, and he's pointing to something even larger that's about to happen. Look at verse 3. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when, these things, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. 
and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they ask the very question that we all want to know, which is, when will these things happen? And you see to this day, people are still asking the question, when are the end times going to happen? Everybody wants to have a prediction of when it's going to happen. So they're asking the question that we all want to know. And so Jesus responds to their question. And what he does, he responds by answering the second part of the question is, here are the signs that you're going to see. And he doesn't particularly answer when, but he tells them the timing of the events. He says one of the first things that you're going to see is that many people are going to come and they're going to try to lead you astray. Many false prophets will come and they're going to try to lead you astray. You're going to hear about wars. You're going to hear about rumors of wars, nation against nation. You're going to have earthquakes. You're going to have famines. And you think about those things. Now, I think about the very things that are happening today. Now, I'm not getting into the business of trying to predict these things. What I'm saying is, you see a lot of these things happening today. And so what Jesus is doing, particularly with his disciples, he's trying to get them to understand is the destruction of the temple is not the end. This is but the beginning of the birth pains. And so when you start to see these happening, understand it's the beginning of the birth pains. Talking about birth, for anybody who has experienced birth, knows someone that's experienced birth, you sort of know how it works, is as labor goes on, the frequency uh, of the contractions and the duration become longer. And what he's saying is, this is what the experience is like. When these things start happening, this is like the beginning of the labor pains, that these catastrophes will happen, but these don't signal the end. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. It's the beginning of sorrows that are going to happen. And so Jesus talks about, from a world standpoint, the catastrophes that will happen, and he begins to focus specifically on the disciples as individuals. And what he tells them is, I want you to be on guard. And what I want you to do in the midst of the suffering that you're going to experience during this time I want you to go and to bear witness to me. Why? Because the gospel has to be proclaimed to all the nations. The gospel must be proclaimed to all the nations. And so the very first application, the very first point here is this. It's called bearing witness in the midst of suffering. Jesus is speaking specifically to his disciples about what to expect as these birth pains are happening is that they're going to come after you. They're going to persecute you in the midst of it for my name's sake. But I want you to understand that the persecution is not a sign of the very end, but it's what to be expected as the suffering is happening and as we experience these beginning of sorrows. And in fact, what happened, speaking of Jesus telling things that happened, every single one of the disciples was killed except for one, which was John. And so it happened in their lives. There's many who suffer around the world today. So when it says brother against brother, father against child, children against parents, think about the people that have come to know Jesus and whose families have turned on them. Not even just in the country, but around the world. People who have left previous faiths to come to know and to, and to declare Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and the suffering that they have experienced. What Jesus is saying is there will be a time when all will be hated for my name's sake. But I want you to understand this. They may put you in front of councils and they may place you here and they may place you there. But the Holy Spirit will give you words with which to say. Why? Because I want you to go and to bear witness the one who endures to the end, which means the one who does not compromise will be saved because your faith will prove to whom you have placed it in, which is Jesus. And so I think about that for a second for us today. We may not experience the type of persecution that they do in other countries or what the disciples did, but there will be some sort of persecution and suffering that we will experience as a result 
of belonging to Christ and doing it for his namesake. And so we experience many sufferings in our lives on a daily basis, and we can experience larger sufferings in our lives. And what Jesus is saying is this is to be expected, but people will look and see how you respond when you belong to him. The the Holy Spirit will give you the words with which to speak and how to respond, but this will be a witness to whom you belong to. God is going to continue to spread the gospel. Not in spite of suffering, but he uses suffering as a way to continue to spread. I think it's also a reminder for us of how in our lives we can often focus on things that just don't mean much. In the grand scheme of life, they don't mean much. That our lives should be about being a witness to Christ. So the job that you have, the family that you're in, the place that you live, are each places that God has placed you to be a witness to who he is. Jesus will give you the words which to say. Why? Because he went through it himself. And he's taking you through something that he has been through himself. And so Jesus starts off by telling them. So he transitioned, talking about the destruction of the temple. This leads to a larger conversation about the end times and what to look for being prepared. And so Jesus tells them of preparedness, being ready to suffer, and then he transitioned here in verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, Let the one who was on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who was in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And the Lord has, if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Then, and then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray. If possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. And so Jesus talks about this idea of the abomination of desolation. If you go back to the book of Daniel, in uh, Daniel 11, 31, it talks about this. The, the abomination of desolation is the Antichrist. And what it's saying is he will be in a place where he should not be, desecrating the temple, doing something that he should not be doing. And so as a result of that, there will be a desolation. What this presupposes is that the temple will be rebuilt. That way for he can be in a place where he ought not to be. But what Jesus is saying right here is, to the citizens of Judea, if you are there during this time, when you see it, I'm telling you to flee because there will be trouble like that has not been seen before. Trouble is coming. And these are the events that are going to bring a great tribulation. And what he says is, I'm telling you, it's gonna be so bad that when you flee, don't turn around and get your cloak. It's going to be that bad. It's going to be a time of terrible suffering, worse than anything that we've seen already. In fact, it's so bad that God even cuts the days short because man would not survive. But during that time, there's going to be people that come that claim to be me, saying, look, here he comes. There's going to be false prophets, and they're, they're going to try to lead you astray. And so the second thing, The second application that we see right here, what Jesus is saying, be on guard. What he's saying is, take heed. You need to live your life with an urgency, with a boldness, with a focus on eternity. And that God will take care of those who belong to him, the elect, for his name's sake. But this idea of birth, remember, as birth gets closer, the pain gets greater. The frequency, the duration is greater. And so if we stop right there for a second, the first thought we may have is, well, this won't happen in my lifetime. 
And so what Jesus is doing is he's, he's addressing those who are going to be there at this time. Remember, we still haven't figured out when this is going to happen, but he's addressing those who will be there for the type of suffering that will happen. He's telling them is in the midst of it, you may want to turn away to somebody who is preaching to your itching ears. They're going to kind of try to, try to come to you and say, here is the Christ. And Jesus is saying, I'm telling you, don't follow them. The one who endures to the end will be saved. And so Jesus goes on in the very next thing he addresses exactly how he's going to come. But what he's saying is, I want you to be on guard. And so whether we're a part of that time or we're not, Jesus sharing words for us that we should still remember is even in our lives today, we're still called to be on guard for anybody who comes claiming to be him, claiming to be the way. Jesus is laying out exactly what it's going to look like and exactly how he's going to return. And so look at this in verse 24. But those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And they, then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Verse 28. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and put out its leaves, you know the summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the, he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And so before Jesus comes, what he's saying is there's going to be cosmic catastrophes. This is a reminder of Daniel's vision. And what he's saying is Jesus is not going to be coming in the way that other people are going to be coming. They're not going to be saying, look, there's Jesus, or look, this is Jesus. He's going to be coming in the clouds, like there's one of the Son of Man. He says, that's when you'll know it's me. But be sure that he's going to come. How do we know? Because he told you about his death and resurrection. That happened. He told you about the destruction of the temple. We see that happen. And so we can be sure the very things that Jesus said will happen too. But before that time, he's going to come and he is going to gather the elect. Just as you know how a fig tree works, he says, when its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you can look at that sign and say, summer is close by. He says, when you see these things happen, know that he is near at the very gate. When you see these things. And those in that generation, the generation that is there then, he says, they won't pass away until they see these very things take place. We can trust Jesus in his words. And again, I think about this and I think that it can seem very distant. It can seem very not relevant to our lives today. But what Jesus is saying is, I want you to always remember and have a bigger view of eternity of what is happening here. What God is doing. You know, we talk about uh, this idea of the J-curve being the suffering into death and a resurrection, the normal shape of the Christian life. And I almost look at the Bible and look at creation as going through, you know, you've got creation and then as a result of sin, creation suffers and it goes through this dying and then only to have this resurrection. I almost see the same thing happening right here as creation is going through, through birth pains and creation is groaning. The Apostle Paul talks about that. And creation is groaning only to what? Only to have a new creation. But this is what it must go through to have the new creation. And so again, we ask the question, well then when is this going to happen? Look what he says in verse 32. But concerning that day or hour, because he knows that they want to ask that. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. 
be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is sort of answers the question of when, which Jesus says it's only for the Father to know. But he's saying this to his disciples. The disciples did not see the abomination of desolation. They did not see these things happen. And yet Jesus' words to them still were, stay awake. You don't know when he's coming. And so what you should be found doing during this time is the same thing as if a man goes on a journey, a master goes on his journey, he leaves his home, he puts his servants in charge, and while they're in charge, they're watching the house, and they each have work to do. That's what he's calling us to do as believers. Not only to his disciples, but believers also. What he's saying is this, and this is really the third application. Be ready and watch. We're called to watch his house, his church. He's placed us in and made us his church together. How are we watching the church and reflecting him and reflecting what we do in his love as a church? His authority. We've been given his authority here. He lives his life through us. And lastly, his work. That our lives are about doing his work. What I want you to see here is even though we may not experience these very things that are happening, he's still giving us a charge. This is what your life is about. As believers, this is what our lives are about. It's about living a life that reflects him and points people to him because what he's saying is the gospel must be preached. And this is for those in the future and now. And so, we said this before, oftentimes in scripture, Jesus tells of things that will happen. I love how he says earlier, go and find a colt and you'll see it tied. And if anybody asks you, tell them the Lord needs it. And what happened? That happened. Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple. That happened. And Jesus talked about his death and resurrection. That happened. The gospel message, the full gospel message, is a message that Jesus came as a man. He humbled himself. He suffered. He died. And he rose again. And he is now at the right hand of the Father. And so what Jesus is saying right here is this description is a description of almost that for creation is that creation god created heaven and earth sin entered the world there was suffering and it's almost like creation is going to go through this death only to be reborn again resurrected again into the way that it was always meant to be this is how we're called to live in the midst of the birth pains that will be experienced. Bear witness in the midst of the suffering. Be on guard against those who are false prophets. Be found faithful. And lastly, is be ready and watch as servants. Let's pray. Father, I know whenever we get into discussions about end times, it can get really, really deep, but we pray that you would help us just to keep our focus on what's important right now, what you want us to see, and how it applies to our daily lives. Lord, let us not get caught up in thinking that this won't happen during my lifetime. This has no uh, implications to my life right now, Father. I pray for those who have given their life to Christ already. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be on guard, help us to know you so well that anybody who is a false prophet, that we can recognize them, Lord, and to help us to be just attentive, Lord, to what you've called us to do as servants, knowing that you could come at any time, Father. 
And so we pray for that for believers, for those who have not given their life to Christ. Pray that you would hear the message that Jesus is saying. Jesus is not in the business of saying things that don't happen. When Jesus says something that's going to happen, it's going to happen. The question is, are you ready if he does come? And so what Jesus, one of the things he does is he gives his life as a way to be forgiven of our sins. Have we lived our life apart from God? And it's a free gift that he offers. And I want to just give you an opportunity now and to tell you and to implore you, don't wait. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed the rest of today. To take this time and to give your life to Christ. And this is a prayer that you can pray right where you are and just to say these words. Say, dear God, I've sinned against you my whole life. I've lived my life apart from you. I ask for forgiveness of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ was punished and died on the cross and rose again so that I could be forgiven of these sins. And I thank you for your salvation. And if you prayed that prayer, we just ask that you would just let us know as a staff, email us, let us know so that we may walk with you and show you what life looks like next. Father, we thank you so much for our time today. We pray that you would continue to use this scripture to speak into our lives, Father. And we ask this and pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.